so um, Gareth's going to present for roughly 20 minutes, uh-huh. um, and then after there's going to be chances for question and answers, and I'd really like you to ask questions. So it could be that you're unsure about certain things, because Gareth's going to tell you it's conceptual art, which is kind of tricky to understand, so you might have some questions there, or you may be interested in a certain, I don't know, artist that he's um, discussed. So just be thinking when you're listening to Gareth about the potential questions to ask him at the end. Right, conceptual art, lucky people. Uh, first thing, um, conceptual art is a massive, massive thing. The sheer scope of the movement is utterly phenomenal, and its implications have extended to art production, art appreciation, the gallery, the structure, the art market, and beyond. Um, trying to fit this into 20 minutes is one of the most stupid things I've ever tried to do. But, uh, right. Secondly, there is a common misinterpretation of what conceptual art is or was. Many works or artists are often referred to as conceptual, mainly because there is a strong emphasis on a thought process apparent in the work itself. Or often, this is on the part of the artist being overly esoteric with their themes or messages, leading to the viewer not immediately understanding what is going on in the work. Um, what conceptual art is, it removes traditional materials from uh, art practice. And the first thing we do to understand conceptual art is go all the way back to Marcel Duchamp. Um, so there we've got a urinal, which is one of the most iconic art objects of the 20th century. Uh, what Duchamp has done here is to pre- present generic quotidian objects within the gallery space, thus commenting upon the psychic structure of the gallery as an institution, or rather saying that the gallery was, at the time, the status given enter- entity which made art art. So at the time, structural linguistics had just come into uh, common knowledge with Ferdinand Saussure. Um, structuralism basically says that we understand a language or a thing in relation to the context, a societal context, which gives it meaning. So what Duchamp has done here is taken something that we would give no consideration to if walking into a public toilet, placing it in a gallery space, thus offering it up for aesthetic and intellectual discourse. Next up, Gada. Was affiliated with him, inspired by Duchamp. Gada was born in Zurich, Switzerland, in about 1916, and there's a very good reason for this. Switzerland being a neutral country during the First World War, artists retreated to Switzerland in order to A, avoid being sent to war, and B, pursue art. Uh, Hugo Ball, Kurt Schutters, Francis Picabia, and Hannah Hock, so you all know collage, um, uh, collage and all the various activities that went on during Dada. Uh, political, political agitation was one of them. And we have René Magritte. Again, plays with uh, language. We have a pipe and a statement, this is not a pipe, which initially makes no sense. But if you think about it, we have the pipe is a pictorial representation. Uh, in the same image, we have the sign and the signifier, meaning the, the word, the word, and the picture. Uh, Marie is playing on this, and later on, Joseph Kosuth will play along with this in the 1960s. Fluxus from the late 1950s. Fluxus proposed an absolute breaking down of the barriers between artistic disciplines. Fluxus means to flow. So basically what we're doing there is breaking down traditional barriers between what can, can 
what can be considered art, artistic practices, artistic materials. Um, it went, started to slowly break down the disciplines as well. So it started to go into theatre, dance, uh, very early video was starting to be made at this, at this point in time. And just prior to Fluxus, Robert Rauschenberg and the very famous Therese de Cooney. What Robert Rauschenberg has done is he asked Willem de Kooning for a drawing to erase, basically, and offer up. Um, and what we can see being done here is an erasure, a literal erasure of that which has been before. And here we are, the self-referential in conceptual art. More often than not, conceptual art was concerned with art itself. And like any other art movement at the time, conceptual art offered a critique of accepted art practices and the way in which art was observed and perceived. So we're no longer looking at art as a thing which offered beauty or aesthetic stimulus alone. What we're doing is going back to Duchamp saying Duchamp considered all other art than his to be retinal, as in it, uh, it appeals to the eye first. Uh, it might also can uh, appeal to the brain, but uh, before Duchamp you could not really conceive of an art which went straight to the brain. Uh, one of the first very important works of conceptual art on display is a chair. We have uh, the chair in the middle, in the gallery space, the photograph of the chair, and a dictionary definition of a chair. By using this combination of variants on the theme of a chair, Joseph Kasuth is in 1965 inviting the viewer to contemplate the true essence of language. In short, which is the real chair? Is it the the actual chair, the photographic representation, or the dictionary definition. The mm -hmm. soup would go on to use shovels. And one and hammers. And what he's doing here is using art as a philosophical tool. Uh, the philosophical model had started to break down thanks to what Ludwig Wittgenstein had, had, uh, had said about language not actually being grounded in anything. Language is kind of floating all around us. And it's our relationship to objects which gives, our, our, which gives us meaning. So, also at the same time, Lawrence Feiner, as far as the eye can see, uh, working exclusively with text since the 60s. Um, you see what Feiner's doing there, uh, as far as the eye can see, is reducing with text the landscape painting. It's giving you everything that a landscape painting in the 19th century would have done and he's given it, given it you as an utter reduction. Conceptual art as political agitation. As conceptual art became more globalised, artists who concerned themselves with external political matters began to use a methodology as proposed by Sol Lewitt, Lawrence Viner, to interfere with pre-existing cultural framework. Sildo mirrorless here, using empty Coke bottles, which at the time would have been sent back to the plant for recycled well, to be cleaned and used again. So he's gotten these recyclable bottles, taken the writing off, and screen printed his own on there. So, um, well, it's in 
uh, Brazilian, really. So what you have there is a recipe for a Molotov cocktail. The evolution of conceptual art. Paul Feck on the left, Ilya Kamakov on the right. Conceptual art only lasted until about 1975. The reason for this, it was pretty much utterly self-defeating. Um, there's only a, a certain amount that you can actually remove art materials, art objects, until conceptual art essentially just becomes writing. John Baldessari in the mid 70s kind of coined the phrase post-conceptual. And now this is in response, anything that's got post at the end of it generally isn't the opposite of the thing before it. It's taking the ideas and altering it to fit with, a, with the cultural zeitgeist. So at the time, what we started to see in the 70s was an emergence in video art, installation art, site specific art, also the computer, which is key in post-conceptualism. It's, uh, it's a term which is used to define an attitude towards materials rather than the materials themselves. And pretty much conceptual art where it is today. Oliver Ellison, Douglas Gordon, so we've got installation, we've got video. Conceptual art didn't actually become anything, in my opinion. I think conceptual art altered the way we look at art so drastically that art altered itself to meet conceptual art. Um, the way we see things these days, we generally take it for granted that there is a, a concept or a thought process gone into the work 